Remember when you were back in school? No, not on the playground. Maybe in high school, or even college. And the teacher would put a complex problem up on the board. Let's say the class was math. He asked a question. Let's write down the answer just by using this formula. You took one look at it, and somehow, fortunately, maybe even miraculously, you immediately knew the answer. You just knew it. So you wrote it down, you turned it in, and when you got your paper back, there was a big red circle in the empty space where you were supposed to show your work. What the heck? The answer was right, but that wasn't good enough. You had to show your work. Kind of frustrating, but I get it now. At DIA, we don't worry about the big red circles because we almost never show our work to the public. I did say, almost never. There are exceptions. You remember 1962 and the Cuban Missile Crisis? That was the time the world avoided Armageddon. Even if you weren't around then, you might remember because we did a podcast about it. We told the story of when DIA analysts went to the United Nations to show the world declassified proof of nefarious activities being perpetrated by the Soviet Union. These enlarged photographs clearly show six of these missiles on trailers and three erected. And that is only one example of the first type of ballistic missile installation in Cuba. They say some things never change, and they might be right, because in 2023, DIA analysts were once again at the UN with the goods on Russia. Except this time, Russia had a different partner in crime, Iran. As Russia loses soldiers, territory, and momentum in the face of Ukraine's latest counteroffensive, it's turning to other nefarious actors for support, chief among them, Iran. The White House says it's concerned... A team from DIA's Middle East Africa Regional Center, or MARC for short, went from Washington, D.C. to the United Nations in New York. At the United Nations that day were representatives from countries both friend and foe to the United States. The mission of the team was to enlighten representatives of those countries about unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, drones, Iranian-made and used by Russia to attack Ukraine. Citing the use of Iranian-made Shahid drones in the attack on Kyiv, President Zelensky has put forth a bill to sanction Iran for its alleged role in arming Moscow. Kyiv has accused Iran... DIA had the proof. Propellers, crankshafts, rotary engines, wing stabilizers, antennas, and more. It was put on display at the U.S. Mission to the U.N., There, senior diplomatic representatives from 42 member nations and multiple media outlets were able to understand the threat Iranian drones represent. What are these drones? What do they do? Tell us what we're talking about here. It's something that we call a one-way attack drone. And so essentially what that means is that this is a one-time use drone. Right behind the nose cone, there is a warhead. It flies to a target, impacts it, and then that warhead explodes. So in a sense, it's almost like a missile. Overnight, Russia striking Ukraine's main port city of Odessa with Iranian-made explosive drones, killing at least three people, say Ukrainian officials. Iran now providing... This drone has one purpose, and that's to kill. This is DIA Connections. The relative calm of Kyiv rocked by loud blasts earlier this week, but these were not the now familiar rocket fire or artillery strikes. They were a barrage of deadly drones, dozens across several cities, and the largest assault of its kind on civilian targets since the war started. Russia is using these drones now to target civilian infrastructure. They've targeted civilians, they've targeted military sites. And so these drones are simplistic, but good at one very, very limited job. It's the latest evidence of an evolving partnership between Russia and Iran. Iranian leaders deny supplying any weapons to Russia. That's at odds with the U.S. assessment. Thanks for joining us on DIA Connections. We're calling this episode, Show and Tell, Iranian UAVs in Ukraine. The experts were wrong about Ukraine surviving an invasion. More importantly, the Russians were wrong too. Their plan was to make quick work of the Ukrainians, 
plow right through them. That didn't happen, and for Russia, the result was severely depleting its own precision-guided munitions in the war's opening months. So they needed help, and they got it from Iran. DIA had physical proof that Iran was in cahoots with Russia. The information was declassified. And that's the gist of this story and the reason for the big show and tell at the UN. Seeing is believing. Touching and holding is even better. We were able to show them these pieces. These diplomats were able to look at the pieces themselves. They could touch them. They could listen to us explain them. And you could literally see for some of these diplomats who not, had not either tracked the issue closely or hadn't really seen the evidence, you could see them make the connections in their head. So our main role here is to show that Iran is essentially lying and to provide that evidence. That's a DIA senior intelligence analyst and a member of the team who helped make the Iran-Russia military connection. He joined us to discuss the evidence, the reasons for going public with it, and why a stylish-looking report was created for everyone to see. The report's called Iranian UAVs in Ukraine, a visual comparison. You can check it out for yourself on DIA.mil. Exposing the truth is always a good story, especially when it begins at an unlikely place. Here's DIA historian Paul Isaacson to kick it off. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks. Pleasure to be here. I understand that this began with a soccer game? It really did. I was taking my four-year-old son to his soccer game. As they're wrapping up, I was sitting there on my phone kind of scrolling through the news. One of the articles that popped up was a, a piece that essentially was saying our European allies were coming back to the United States and telling policymakers here, listen, we understand that you have publicly released a lot of information that Iran is supplying Russia. We've seen some of the images, but we would like more proof from the United States. We'd like you to show us more evidence that directly supports that. So you're hearing these news reports about a lack of evidence. You know some of the evidence that DIA has. What did you ask yourself about what is our role? What is DIA's role in all this? What we asked ourselves is what can DIA do? What can we do with this information that we have and some of the unique capabilities we have that we can get something out there to arm the policymaker? Why is it so critical that the world know that Iran is supplying these drones to Russia? Iran, by supplying these drones, was going to and now has positioned itself as Russia's main military supplier of, of military hardware in this conflict. If you look broadly, there's not a lot of other countries that are supporting Russia. They are giving a significant amount of material. By May 2023, Iran had supplied over 400 uh, of these drones to Russia. They're helping them now build a factory. They're really going all in. When you read a lot about this war, there's a lot of discussions about industrial bases, supply of munitions. Iran has stepped up in a way to Russia that no other country has. So we knew that story from day one was a big one, and it was that both policymakers needed to know and the public needed to know. All this wreckage is because of these metal triangles, which form what appear to be Iranian-made kamikaze drones. DIA collected components from actual debris of UAVs used in attacks in Ukraine and the Middle East. Drones from two different locations, thousands of miles apart, with nearly identical characteristics, traceable to Iran. A lot of these UAVs had a very distinctive Iranian shape, whether it's looking at the wing stabilizers, so this is the very edge of the wing, you'll find that they have these unique winglets. Um, sometimes it's the overall shape of the drone itself. Other major thing that we looked at was some of the internal construction and design. So inside some of these Iranian UAVs, they use this sort of common honeycomb Pattern. So if you were to actually look inside a, a piece of drone debris, it looks like a gold honeycomb. It's very small, just a couple millimeters thick, very, very lightweight. But as you look at this debris, those sort of internal components are the same. And then we looked at the larger components. So you can take a look at something like an engine. You can place those two side by side. And then as you look to find differences between them, you essentially can't. You'll find the same propellers, the same um, gears. You know, even in some cases, the way they explode, the propellers are shattering in the same way. And so as we looked through, it really was those three factors, the overall shape, the internal construction, and then the individual components that we were able to compare simply using photographs to make that case. 
The continued proliferation of Iranian drones used in Ukraine was a violation of Security Council Resolution 2231. The Iran-Russian collaboration was hard to deny, but they did so anyway. Here's Russia's representative to the United Nations. The aim of our Western colleagues is clear. They attempt to hit two targets at once, inventing an artificial pretext to put pressure on Russia and on Iran. And here's Iran's representative. Iran categorically rejected unfounded and unsubstantiated claims that Iran has transferred UAVs for the use of the conflict in Ukraine. It is recently disappointing that to pursue the political agenda, these states are trying to launch a disinformation campaign against Iran. Prior to the UN show-and-tell, dignitaries came to DIA for a personal show-and-tell. After seeing the physical UAVs, their opinions of the intelligence were very different than the Russians and Iranians. The ambassador of Israel to the United States was so impressed he posted this on his social media. Quote, The meticulous analysis exposing Iran's malign and destabilizing behavior proved beyond a reasonable doubt that Iran is brazenly lying in its denials of any such involvement in Ukraine. Thank you to DIA for sharing this invaluable information and exposing Iran's regime's lies. In the intelligence world, we often have to deal with levels of certainty, right? We're 50% certain, we're 80% certain. Is this one of those rare, we got them? What I would say is, you know, we always have to use assessment language. I personally would use almost certainly, which is over a 95% chance. Frankly, to me, this is fact. I believe that it's beyond a shadow of a doubt that they are absolutely Iranian in origin. You can just compare this material. It is extremely hard to find a major difference between the two that indicates that it comes from anywhere but Iran. The decision to declassify intelligence was step one. Step two was how to present the material in a way that can be rapidly absorbed and understood by both policymakers and the public. Something that can cut through the noise and is easily digestible. Remember earlier when an aha moment came at the soccer field with his son? It happened again. Same son, different location. This time, it wasn't so much of an aha moment. It was more an open up and say ah moment. Inspiration can come in the most unlikely places. One of the things that I did was actually linking back to, at the time, my four-year-old son, because one of the things when we go to the dentist's office, you find is they leave these highlight magazines around. So if you're familiar with it, it's kind of like a kid's magazine and they have games. One of the ones my son and I love to play is this find the difference in the pictures, and they'll have like a schoolhouse, and there's side by side, and one, and one the flag will be up, or there'll be like an apple on a table and it'll be missing. What we realize is that what this should be is almost like a highlights magazine, like that general creative concept that put the two pictures next to each other and then find the differences between the two. So that basic concept. The team drilled down on the Highlights Magazine concept. They created a 14-page, 11 by 17 report featuring side-by-side photo comparisons of wing stabilizers, rotary engines, and ignition components. It's simple, stylish, and effective. Creating it was not just another day at the office, but it was clearly the right approach. Especially since they saw how well it worked at the other office. You know the one. It's at the small paper company in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Our team, when we looked at this, there's this great meme out there with Pam from the office where she's holding two photographs next to each other and she says, Corporate needs you to find the differences between this picture and this picture. And then she says, They're They're the the same same picture. picture. That general idea with the Highlights magazine, that really is what drove us towards this whole design. Oftentimes, the intelligence community writes detailed reports with lots of big words to show how smart we are, and it maybe loses an audience, right? You wanted to make this report very different. Why and how did you make it different? When you're in the intelligence community and you are usually writing, you know, a DIA often for the Secretary of Defense, there's a certain level of intrinsic trust. You have a brand, you have a recognition, you know when you see an article from DIA or any of our other compatriots in the intelligence community, there's a certain level of trust that the average policymaker will give it. That's different. In the public, you're going to run up against individuals who have zero trust in the IC. Individuals have every reason to doubt the United States. You're going to run into things like Russian trolls, Iranian trolls, 
people and organizations that their whole purpose is to discredit what you're doing. So the other thing that that helped us shape is understanding that when we built a methodology and we used photographs, we needed to build a way in which the average user could do the analysis and see the methodology themselves. That's why when you look at our piece, you often see in the middle, we draw the UAV itself or the drone, and then we show you exactly the comparisons we're making. So it's not us telling you it's the same, it's allowing you to make that analysis yourself. And that is something that we don't normally do, but we did all those things to try to insulate the product from things like a Russian troll, from a doubter, from someone who's just going to say, this is fabricated or fake. That's how the first official Western government evidence of Iranian UAVs used by Russia in Ukraine was created. It was nice, really nice, but was it enough? At a brainstorming session, the team pondered a question. What's the measure for success? How would they know if the report was making an impact? That's when someone said success would be if John Kirby, the White House National Security Advisor, held up the report on national TV during a press briefing about the Iran-Russia connection. That would be amazing. And that would be a crowning achievement. Well, guess what happened? Not that, but arguably something even better did. So public awareness, public exposure, this going wide was always going to be really a key benchmark to your success in this. And there was a moment when you realized this report really had gone public in a very, at a very high level. Tell us about that. So there was a morning in early March when there was a tweet by Christian Amanpour, a CNN foreign correspondent who often interviews very high-level foreign dignitaries. And it was advertising an interview that she had upcoming with Iran's foreign minister, Emil Abdelahian. Foreign Minister, welcome to the program. Christian Amanpour is a 14-time Emmy Award winner and CNN's chief international anchor. The interview with the Iranian foreign minister was mostly about Iran's human rights violations until she flipped the script on him. But first I want to ask you about another really important thing, and that is about Iranian weapons to Russia that are targeting Ukrainians during this war. And as it's going through, all of a sudden it cuts to these images where she's taking the actual photographs from the book. She's taking the analysis we've done. She puts it in front of him and essentially asks the foreign minister. You've probably seen these pictures, right? So. That is a, a drone, a, an Iranian drone that was found inside and recovered from Ukraine. This as well, with the president of Ukraine standing next to it. This they have compared Who to, to Iran. This is the Ukrainians. This is the Ukrainians, and this is from open sources from like Yemen and other. How can they prove this drone with just a photograph? Are you denying it? Okay. Are these two the same things? And you kind of watch him for the next three, four minutes stumble through, never have a great answer. Why are you sending drones to uh, violating all sorts of sanctions, but still also causing a huge amount of death? It's a really incredible moment to see a piece that you have done have an impact that way, that someone is taking this, putting it in front of the foreign minister of the country who is doing the act you're accusing of and say, how is this not you? It was a really, really incredible moment. One I will note, too, we did not ask CNN to do. We didn't even know they were going to do this, and that was, in a way, an example of the success we had. We put this piece out to be a tool not just for policymakers or for foreign governments. It's for the public to use, too. And the fact that another organization, in this case a media organization, picked it up and confronted the foreign minister with it, to us, that's one of the biggest wins you can get. Exposing the truth. What you and your team have done here with this product and everything associated with it is just a great example of that central mission of DIA, to expose the truth. I think another way to put it, the, the common vernacular we're using these days is combating misinformation, right? And so that is one of the missions of DIA. And when you, when you look at how we have built this product, how we've built the display that we have, a lot of it is that Iran and Russia have a, what we would argue, they're essentially lying. I think exposing the truth, combating disinformation, however you want to frame it, it is something that DIA has done. It's in our DNA and in our history, but it appropriately fits with what we have done in the past, and I think a continuation of that legacy. In season three of DIA Connections, we told a similar story about how photographic evidence was used to tell the truth about aerial assaults originating from Russia. 
we thought it would be appropriate to revisit a portion of that episode now. That show was called Ukraine, Truth Be Told, and the subject of the show was Pulitzer Prize-winning war photographer Lindsay Adario. Just after the Russian invasion, she was working for the New York Times in Ukraine and photographed a missile strike killing four people at a bridge used by civilians as an evacuation route. Russian government officials claimed they weren't firing at civilians, but the picture told the real story. The disturbing image made the front page of the March 6, 2022 edition of the New York Times. Front page for all the world to see, and for Putin to try and deny the undeniable. Here's Lindsay as she described the events of that day. So it was March 6th, and I had been in Ukraine since the 14th of February. But for some reason, I didn't feel like I was doing a good job, like I was getting sort of to the heart of the civilian casualty, um, sort of the toll the war was having on civilians. We knew that there were people fleeing from Irpin and Bucha, which were uh, towns in the cities or towns on the suburbs of Kiev, across this bridge that was broken. We saw across the street that the territorial defense, the Ukrainian forces, were bringing out some wounded people. So we ran across the street, and there was like a cement almost cubby um, that was almost like a checkpoint. And so we took cover there. And within minutes, a round came in and landed sort of a few hundred feet off in the distance. My security guard said, you know, do you want to pull back? And I said, no, because they know that this bridge is where they're bringing the wounded and the elderly and people are coming out. And so they won't come closer. They're probably aiming at a Ukrainian position off in the woods. Through her viewfinder, Lindsay watched as parents rushed their children through the line of fire seeking safety. Another round came in that came in closer. I popped up and then another round came in literally like, I don't know, 25 feet from us. And I saw the flash. I popped up and everything was very dusty and chaotic and I couldn't really see what was across the street. There were four bodies. I saw immediately sort of the tiny little boots of a child, and I thought, oh my God, I, I, I couldn't believe that it was a family. I worked my way around, I took a few photos, thinking to myself, I can't believe what I just witnessed. I have to make these photographs. But of course, I was dying inside because I have two children. A mother and her two children, and a man who was a church volunteer trying to usher the family to safety, were all killed by Russian mortar fire. As a general practice, the Times doesn't usually publish photos of bodies, especially when they're children. But this time was different. Russian President Vladimir Putin denied that his forces were deliberately targeting civilians, and this photo was evidence that told a different story, the truthful one. But Lindsay still felt the story was incomplete. I asked myself, who were these people in life? You know, we've seen them in death, and and who were they? It didn't seem fair that the only image the world knew was of their sort of lifeless bodies. And so I said, maybe we should try to sort of piece their lives back together. You know, who was this woman and children? We made the decision to interview the father. It was the most devastating moment, I imagine, of his life, but he so graciously met with us a few days later. He had been out east taking care of his sick mother. So by the time he came back to Kiev, it was like three days later, he sat down with us and told us all about his life and his family and his wife and his children and why he wasn't there and how he spoke to his wife the night before and was so sorry he couldn't be there to help them get across the bridge. And she sort of joked and said she would be fine. And then he learned about their death, of course. 
At the end of the interview, I said to him, I, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that I'm the one who took these photographs. You know, I, I hope you understand how important they are. And he looked at me and he said, of course, they needed to be published. And, and you know, he he said so much as, as painful as it was, he said, it's very important. And he understood profoundly the power and the importance of those images and that it would hopefully show the world that Russia was targeting civilians. Lindsay's photograph told the truthful story of deliberate attacks on civilians. As we said, the New York Times doesn't usually publish photos of bodies, especially when they're children. And similarly, DIA's decision to produce a declassified product to depict the Iran-Russia connection was unusual. But the truth was paramount, and the report directly supported U.S. efforts in the conflict. It gave policymakers and allies a DIA product that they could use to inform their actions. Another case of show and tell. As always, thanks for listening to DIA Connections. <laughs>